world of work. The world of work. The opportunity for men and women to put their skills to work in satisfying careers contributes to the quality of life for all people. The dignity of work has always been part of the American story. Classrooms that connect learning with real work experiences give, give students, students the, the opportunity, opportunity to explore vibrant career fields and, and define areas experience. of interest in which they can make an impact in the real world. In the real world. In the real world. You want to feel like you've made a difference. I think that's a fundamental human need. In a working class, history provides clues for solving present day challenges. Math explains the mystery behind technology. We need individuals with strong math and science skills. We need individuals that can operate in a team. And we need individuals with technical skills. And lessons in communication can help us to work together to build rich and rewarding lives. Rich and rewarding lives. Rich and rewarding lives. People who make things are necessary. Students and faculty find passion and purpose where real lives intersect. Where real lives intersect. In a real working class. In a real working class. Working class. Working class. Working class. Working class. Most things in life are more fun when you can game the system. But to game the system, you have to understand the system. You have to understand how things work. You have to be able to think abstractly. The math gives you that advantage. Math is being used in art. It's being used in music today. None of that's possible without understanding all of the mathematics behind that. What most people don't realize is that math is not something we create as human beings. It is something we discover. It is a science. And we've been looking for why our world works for as long as we have recorded history. And the mathematics that is just the symbol structure that we put together to explain what we're seeing happening. Mathematics is a skill, and like any other skill, like carpentry, like learning to drive a car, like learning to read. You're not born with it, you have to learn how to do it. So when somebody says there are math people and there are not math people, well that's just nonsense. If you are willing to invest the time, if you are willing to do the practice, if you are willing to, to study it, everybody can learn to do math. Why do kids need math? How is learning math like climbing a mountain? Does math really explain the mystery behind technology? Can computer games prepare you for a career? We will explore these questions and more during this episode of Working Class Game On Why Math Matters. Math and climbing are similar in that they're both hard. 
If you approach them with joy and you're interested in them, hard is irrelevant. It's something you want to do. If you listen to people who are climbers talk, you won't understand what they're saying. If you aren't familiar with climbing, they'll talk about sending and popping and, and dead pointing and the language. And just like math, it's a language. So you have to understand what the language is before you can understand what people are saying. And then I go out to that ret, right foot through, flag the left out, and just stand up. <laughs> and once you have that, you can get, you get your feet up and stand up into the underclimb. Climbing is divided into bouldering and what's called sport climbing in terms of competition climbing. Um, and it's, it's almost entirely done indoors or on artificial walls outdoors. So we, we actually, as a team, go to different gyms and compete against different teams from different gyms. Outdoor climbing has a very different feel than indoor climbing. And so we've been training indoors primarily, but by climbing outdoors, they actually hone skills that will help them climb indoors. It's difficult to teach kids that it's okay to fail. Um, and I think with math, sometimes students go in with the idea that I'm going to fail or I don't want to look stupid. And they have to realize that math is hard. It's regardless of what level you find it hard at, it's going to be hard. It's just like a progression in climbing. When you learn that tenacity actually helps you get through something. And if the same sort of tenacity is applied to math or learning of any sort, you can push through it. One of the nice things about bouldering in the gym is that you can learn to fail. In fact, you're going to fail. You're going to fail repeatedly. You're going to get up, you're going to fall off, you're going to get up and fall off. There's no stigma attached to it. With the climbing team, so often I say, try this, and, and someone, they'll say, I don't want to try it, why not? Um, I might fail. And I say, you try it to fail. And if they succeed over and over again, then I say, we have to find something that you will fail on. You have to fail in order to get better. And what happens is, you're trying to improve your, your weakest link, because it's the weakest link that's always going to prevent you from completing a route. I think mathematics, I definitely think beauty. And I think that what I see and what I can touch and what I can learn about things that I don't understand yet, that there's more beauty out there. It seems to be kind of normal nowadays to say, oh, I'm a math person or I'm not a math person. And so I pose this argument. Look at the great strides literacy has made, you know, in the last decades. That's been great. You know, people learn to read. We have learned how people learn to read. We have overcome so many learning disabilities in getting everybody to read. And in fact, a teacher would probably be fired if that teacher said to a student, that's okay, you're probably just not a reader. Some people just never read. And of course, I can't even say that with a straight face. You know, that's horrible. You would never say that to anybody. It may be harder in some ways to learn some pieces of mathematics for some people, but we need to find a way for math literacy. Somehow we have begun to believe a myth that if something's hard, we're not meant to do it. We 
somehow believe that psychologically certain people are meant to do certain things. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that we have certain abstract limitations designed into us. We may have differences, and we do have strong differences, and we have things that are easier to learn and things are harder to learn, but we can do it. We can learn them. And part of being an educator is finding a way that each of my students can learn. I think probably the best thing a teacher can do ever is love their subject. They have to. It has to be something they want to do. I feel like as a mathematician, you have to sell your subject. You know, you have to love it. You have to bring that magic with you. So you, you have to be able to show students, even if they don't understand, let's say, trigonometry waves, sound waves, light waves, show them anyway. Show them geometric structures that are unusual and yet structurally sound. But they have to know why. Why are we doing this? You know, where is this algebra that seems to go on forever? Where is it going to take me? You know, I have many, many calculus students who say, oh, now I see why we had to learn that. But it really would have been better if they knew where they were going several years ago. You know, if they knew that the math they were learning would take them there. They don't know why. Why would you ever need this algebra? Why would you ever need this geometry, this trigonometry, this calculus? But part of our job is to be able to say, well, this opens this many doors, and this allows you to follow this path. And just to give examples that they're not just requirements to check off. Basically, we need to get them where they want to go. I've seen so many students that appreciate just somebody coming alongside and saying, you can. I've seen you, I know you can, you have it in you. Keep going. At 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. I first became, I guess, aware of computers. Uh, whenever I was actually a very young child, I was about probably about six years old, and I got very interested in the Apollo moon program at that time. Uh, in fact, I used to get up early in the morning to watch the space shots out of NASA, and I was fascinated by the control center, I was fascinated by this entire project, uh, and particularly the machinery that made it all possible. That's one small step for man. I really think the most practical thing that has come out of mathematics has been computing. The computers we understand today really started toward the end of the Second World War uh, when we were trying to decrypt uh, encrypted messages. I think we are on the brink, just like in 1940 when we were passing from solving things like cryptographic problems with pencil and paper to doing it with mechanical machines and then in a very short time vacuum tubes and then in a very short time integrated circuits. My personal feeling is we're, we're standing on a very similar threshold today where we're about to see that the way we solve problems is about to evolve into something different. If you don't understand why things work the way they do, you're gonna come up with solutions that are very short-lived. They'll work for a while, and then they're gonna break down, and if you don't understand what made them work, if you don't understand why the solution needs to be the way it is, you're not gonna be able to solve the next problem that comes up. Open up the default.aspx.cs page. 
Programming is basically talking to a computer to tell it instructions that the computer can understand to complete a task in its simplest form. Jason Horton is one of my gaming and simulation students and he's one of those students that's always seeking more information and always learning and always just doing more. What's that? The second, the second, second one, yeah. What port is that? 1433. When our students start in either the gaming and simulation degree or the web and interactive media degree, we require a certain level of math because in both degrees there's a fair amount of computer programming. The advice that we give pretty much any student coming into an IT related degree is whether you like math or not, take as much as you can. I enjoyed math, but I, I didn't excel at it. And when I first came to college, I was afraid to come to school for a programming degree because I knew back then that it was intense with math. Since then, I, I really enjoyed programming. I picked up math skills along the way, and I think that learning math has just benefited me in learning more in the IT fields. Well, you need to have a good sense in math uh, to understand how computers work at a very basic level, such as uh, in computers everything is in binary, which is all ones and zeros. When you try to convert from a binary number into a decimal number that a human can like understand. Uh, you need to know how to convert it correctly with math. Uh, as far as programming goes, math is also important at a higher level uh, because you need to write mathematical statements a lot of the time to just make the code work, right? Uh, to do what it needs to do. Um, like drawing a circle on a program, you need to know the area of a circle, the, the formula to generate a perimeter around a certain radius to, to make it the correct shape. Um, a big portion of uh, IT is limited if you don't really care that much about math. I understand that a lot of people don't like math and they just, it's sometimes because they, they don't understand the, the concepts and then they get thrown into a higher level math class and they don't fully understand the previous concepts to build on that, because math, you need to build on the previous concepts to continue on. My senior project right now is actually on fractals. Fractals are purely mathematical formula, but they create very intricate patterns and artwork, and it's amazing. I took Raspberry Pis, which are $35 mini miniature computers, basically, and put them in a little cluster together to basically split the work up to generate the fractals uh, to try to compute them faster, uh, because fractals are intensive to compute. It's basically a combination of everything that I've learned so far. Um, so it takes account uh, programming, networking, database, uh, security, the software is the actual code behind rendering it, and the networking is the communication between them. The security is like setting up an account locking system uh, for UI for like an end user to use this system. Uh, and the database would be like storing the rendered pictures so that you can look at them later without having to recompute it again. Uh, so it takes into account a lot of the different techniques that we've learned in the past four years. Parents hear the word gaming and they're like, okay, they're going to be playing Call of Duty for the next four years. When in actuality, it's not just gaming, but there's also that and simulation portion. Gaming is for fun, simulation is for learning, but you're using the same tools. It could be a 2D or a 3D environment to either play and have fun or get your point across. And because they're the same, tools, the students themselves are enjoying what they're learning a little better because they're learning to create a game or a simulation, in their mind a game. So really what they're learning is computer programming.
And uh, I think just the, the word gaming, it, it, it piques their interest. And like, and like I said here, you can see the dead birds on the ground. We look at computer games, we look at the entertainment industry, uh, particularly computer games in the entertainment industry. Uh, and that's an interesting part of the industry. It's got a lot of flash, gets a lot of publicity, but it's not necessarily the largest part of the industry. The larger, more consistent, the more nine to five, blue collar, if you will, portion of the industry is actually in writing simulation software. And the vast majority of simulation software is training software. Uh, getting somebody to learn how to fly a jet, showing them how to land it in a simulator before they splat one into the ground getting somebody to operate a multi-million dollar piece of machinery before they go in and put it in an inconsistent state and have it rip its guts out. These are the things that companies pay a lot of money for. And finding a programmer who is actually capable of writing that software is not a trivial task. This isn't just uh, you know, a passing fad. This isn't just something that their kid wants to do that is never going to get them anywhere in life. This has the potential to actually get them a job that is a, a highly sought after job and that they can do some really great things with it. It comes back to their problem solving ability. If you can learn how to operate and program the computer at fundamental levels, uh, you can get into almost any area of any business that you want to. You always hear about jobs going away to foreign countries. And one of the things I hasten to point out is that a lot of those jobs that are outsourced to go and go away are jobs that are substantially unskilled labor. That is, it's a job we can teach a machine to do, or it's a job that we can teach a human being to do very cheaply. If you want to make yourself more resistant to that type of unemployment, then what you want to do is you want to do the jobs that can't be outsourced. Those are the jobs that require analytics. Those are the jobs that require somebody to sit down and be able to do good problem solving. Fundamentally, analysis jobs require you to have good problem solving skills, good mathematical skills, and if the problem can be solved by a computer, to have good computing skills. And if those are the types of things you have behind you, I don't think you're ever gonna to have to worry about being unemployed. So my advice to anybody who is in school, take your math, take it seriously. If the teacher tells you, well, you do it just because you have to, that's nonsense. You do it because it's gonna be very meaningful for you later in life. It is gonna open up to you all of the jobs in life that can't be outsourced to China or Brazil or India, it's going to open up to you all the opportunities in life that are only available to the people you otherwise look at and say, well, what makes them so damn smart? Well, oftentimes what makes them so damn smart is they took an interest in math uh, and they have that one extra edge that nobody else really has or was ever interested in getting. I like puzzle games. Uh, I, my favorite all-time game is probably Portal and Portal 2. I did my advanced topics project last semester using portals. Um, I basically rewrote my own it's like miniature engine of portals. Basically when you walk into one hole in a wall, you would come out in a different hole in the wall and there's so much math involved with getting the cameras to render correctly as if it was a seamless junction between the two rooms. Uh, so you would walk through it and not even realize that you're walking through a portal to a different area because it's just it's seamless. It looks like you're just walking through a doorway. So I like solving puzzles in the games like that that take advantage of abstract mechanics like that uh, to basically throw off your perception of what is normal and throw you into a new normal. And you have to solve challenges based on those new environments. I grew up on a, an NES and a PS1, so I have a lot of respect for those original games. Uh, my favorite game growing up was Super Mario Bros. 3 and The Legend of Zelda. Uh, I really enjoyed those games. I played them ragged. They're just so much fun. 
the systems back in like the 80s and 90s were extremely limited. Programmers had to be resourceful and very clever with the ways that they went about making these games. Today, programmers don't really have to worry about like memory constraints because now we got, what, 50 terabyte drives coming out soon? Uh, that's ridiculous. Nobody could have ever thought about that before, and they had to work on systems that only had a couple kilobytes of memory total to work with. Um, their entire program had to run inside of that type of memory space, and the processors were extremely limited. I think that the programmers back then were probably stronger programmers than we have today because of this. The restraints that they had, and they had to uh, be resourceful in more ways than one to, to do these things and make games that were fun to play on the limited resources. Can you imagine a world without video games? Thanks to industry pioneers like Atari, you don't have to. Atari brought arcade-style games like the tennis game Pong into homes in the 1970s. Today, Atari's founder, Nolan Bushnell, seeks to inspire a new generation by incorporating technology and practical life experiences into the classroom. It was more about an evolution in technology rather than an innovation on my part. I always knew the home game would be great if we could build it cheap enough. And we had to wait literally until a technology called N-Channel MOS was invented. N-Channel MOS allowed the chips to go fast enough for video rates. You had the complexity that was good enough, first of all, with Pong, and then later on with the VCS. If you were a geek in the 50s, it was ham radio. And so I wanted to get my ham radio license. But, you know, I was 10 years old, and lo and behold, in order to get a ham radio license, you needed to know a little bit of algebra and a little bit of calculus. And that was really uh, a problem for me since I was in the fourth grade or third grade. And so one of the things that I think is important is that once you see a goal, that you can solve it. And so I kind of taught myself just enough algebra and just enough calculus that I could pass the ham radio test. Now, I am by no means a math genius, but it was a situation where it was something I wanted to do, and so it was something I had to do. And, uh, and so I think that that is happening today with a lot of kids. There are 10-year-olds today that are designing their own video games by using Unity. And Unity is easy enough that you can make a mobile game on your cell phone or what have you, but it does take some math. One of the problems that you have in education, the kids have, is they don't know what they want to do when they grow up. And so schools should be a sampler of various new age, new metric, new constructs of thinking. There's a whole series of things that kids need to be able to do before they graduate from high school. Every high school student should know how to put together a PowerPoint presentation. No 10 year old should be allowed to not know how to type at 50 words a minute. Every student should have a tablet or a Chromebook. Computers should be integrated into their school life, not just a computer lab that's tacked on to their school life, because a, a classroom should look more like a startup than like a classroom. You know, stuff like that. Interface life skills and school skills in a real way. And if the student doesn't want to come to school or is bored in school, it's our fault. We have to change what we're doing. We have to open up our eyes and say, there's gotta be a better way. 
we need to find that way. And it's going to be different for different kids. And so therefore the individualization of education becomes even more important where kids, some kids are going to want to learn math using the language of baseball and other kids are going to want to learn math on the language of science or the language of politics. Most of our kids today have been conditioned by the environment they see around them. Everybody has a cell phone, everybody has a smartphone. From a very early age, they learn to play games on them. So if you structure the teaching and learning environment as a game, if you structure it as something where there are clearly defined goals, and there are clearly defined objectives, and there is a clearly defined process for leveling up. You know, I master this, I move to the next level, I master this, I move to the next level. Uh, the kids seem to respond to that very well. Uh, some of the old classic board games, Battleship and Stratego, are very good games that get students to think about what are the strategic things that my opponent's thinking about, and therefore, what are the strategic and problem-solving things that I have to put together? And so getting kids to think about solving those types of puzzles is the very thing that I think will help them in terms of organized thinking. I'm a 70s kid. In the 70s, it was, it was still pretty magical to be able to turn on a little box and hear voices coming out of this little speaker. And, and radio, electronics, computers, technology of this, of this nature was, was magical. It still is magical. My first experience with a computer probably would have been in the early 80s. What was really intriguing about computers was you had full control over something. It was, it was kind of empowering for me at least, to be able to imagine something, think about what logically would make that happen, program it in, and see it occur. I had an opportunity to go to a community college and take a digital electronics class and really begin to understand how this fantastic machine that I was having so much fun with actually worked internally. And I began to use the math that I had learned and understand the laws that governed all this, this phenomenal technology at the time. Everything that we do in electronics, ranging from power distribution to radio communication to launching satellites to high-tech photography equipment and image processing and, and communications networks and so on, all comes down to some very basic principles, very simple math. Math is and has always been an abstract field. That is, you, you visualize numbers and relationships with numbers and properties of things and you can relate them with equations and so forth. So it's very, it's very abstract. The devices that we use and have in the electronics world today, there are, there's a lot of stuff going on in there at a very, very fast rate. And it's, it's very difficult to physically see anything happening. You pull your phone out and you're, you're doing something with it, with an app or whatnot, there's millions of calculations going on every second. And you can't physically see that. So you have to think abstractly. And math really helps you to, to develop that mindset. Having a mathematical mind will help you to understand how things work that you can't always physically see what's going on. Think of a cell, a smartphone, a little tiny device. It is, is a marvel of computing technology. It is a marvel of electromagnetic communications technology, power technology. You have a battery in there, a very tiny battery that you want to squeeze the most energy out of that battery as, as efficiently as possible all electronics, all driven by fundamental mathematical laws. Much of what we can do nowadays with, with technology is, is driven by digital signal processing. It's in all the cameras that we use, 
It's used for data compression whenever you talk on a cell phone and you're trying to send large amounts of information across vast distances in a short time. It's a technique whereby you're using a lot of simple equations, lots of them, and a very powerful processor to get some really amazing things done. Electronics has changed an awful lot over the years. When I was young, very young, I, I thought that a great show and tell presentation would be to bring in a simple single transistor and say this is the most revolutionary thing ever, right? This one little transistor. And now the, the devices that are sitting in all of our pockets right now have literally billions, billions, vast billions of these transistors doing very fast calculations and, and, and um, the scale of the technology has just changed so much over, over my lifetime. We have a real eclectic mix of, of things that our graduates do. We have quite a number of them that are involved in automation fields. Uh, factories and buildings and, and complex systems are controlled by devices that control when things turn on and off and move here and there and so forth. A lot of our students are very, very skilled at these semi-robotic systems where they have, to, they have to know programming, they have to know how to interface equipment to one another, they have to, they have to interface computers to these, these systems, they have to write programs that drive all this sort of stuff. So there's quite a lot of opportunity there. There's also opportunity for circuit design. What's becoming more important in, in this world is to be able to efficiently harness energy, green energy, small batteries, everybody likes small batteries, small devices. How often do you want to charge your phone? As little as possible. So you need people that can to understand and can design and work with circuits that efficiently take a certain volume of energy and make it last all day long. Every washing machine, every microwave oven, everything that has a little blinky light on it has got a microcontroller in there that somebody has to understand how to design, program, make it work, make it interface with the rest of the world. That's what our students are doing. A lot of folks think the next big thing is, is the Internet of Things. Everything's going to have a microcontroller in it. Everything's going to be collecting little pieces of data. Everything is going to be then sending that data to be collected somewhere. Some of the personal fitness trackers that are becoming very popular uh, is an example of, of the Internet of Things, where ubiquitous devices on your body, in your environment, in your car, in your office, monitor things like temperature and uh, heart rate and cholesterol on a moment-by-moment on -moment basis. And this data can be used to target medicines, to inform you of maybe what kind of food choices you should be making, to cut health care costs. These systems need to be designed, they need to be put into place, they need to be tweaked, they need to be programmed, and I think our students are being very well prepared to be part of that next big thing of the Internet of Things. Because we can put sensors everywhere, because we can collect data from everything, should we do it? In many cases, yes. In many cases, no. Engineering ethics is a big part of what we do. And it is important that students are more well-versed than just being able to do the technical things. They have to be able to, to relate this to the real world and, and see the impact of their decisions on the real world and decide and make informed decisions as to how they should implement these systems. You know, you, you see some of the, the movies that are out nowadays, the science fiction movies, 
you have a person standing there just waving their arms around and there's there's 3D computer screens and, and things are just with the spoken word are assembled and, and, and made and, and the snap of a finger. Every single day this is becoming more and more reality. You have a nexus, you have you have computing technology, you have manufacturing technology, 3D printing capabilities, you have amazing advances in, in, in the biomedical field and embedded sensors in the human body. And this stuff is, is starting to come together. What was science fiction in the 60s when I was a kid, Star Trek, that's old hat now. You know, we've got the we've got the handheld communicators, you know, we're still working on the transporter beams, but that stuff's here we're getting there with, with this convergence of amazing technology. I think a lot of students limit their potential for the future in, in certain STEM careers, in, in, in the high technology careers, engineering type careers, uh, because they, they give up on the math early. And sometimes math is the only thing that's stopping them from going forward. So they, they believe they can do the technology, but they don't see that hidden mathematics behind the scene. And I think one of the most important things that I think both teachers and parents and students need to understand is that math is more than manipulating equations. It's more than pushing numbers around on a piece of paper. You need to understand the concept, the relationship to the real world. If you think of it as in the way of computers, it's an input and an output. In mathematics, we're going to call it a domain and a range. But basically, math performs operations on certain numbers or letters that represent something in reality. And so you give numbers to a certain operation and it puts a relationship to it. So maybe the relationship is that it doubles something. Or maybe it doubles something and then adds four to it. And that produces something different. Those are the foundational building blocks, so to speak, in order to, to create something new and different. It's understanding the concept more than the manipulation. A lot of students see math as just, uh, I can work the problem, okay, here's the answer. And, and my question would be more as, what does it represent in the real world? They need to know that, and so there's, there's a connection between understanding the real phenomena and then building on it. The math is tied to the science and the technology, it's all, it's all interwound together. When you look at our world and how much we've expanded in transportation, healthcare, and industry, and all the products that have been created, uh, the robots that we have running many of our manufacturing plants, and how they're controlled by routines. Today, you don't really need this person so much to do the actual physical part of constructing something. You need someone that knows how to control the machine that's doing the physical control. What I think is exciting about math today is math is being used in art, it's being used in music today, it's used in television broadcasting. It, it, none of that's possible without understanding all of the mathematics behind that. The sad part is that people don't realize that it's behind the scenes so much because we're a consumer and we simply want to use the, the product. I was teaching in a public school when the first Apple came out. It was a black apple at that time. And um, I remember taking a course in my graduate work in machine language. And that's when you really understand where the mathematics came into play in the development of programs and computers which control most of the technology. Everything was based on the binary system. Power on, power off. And we work with two numbers, zero and one. And so when I wrote programs, I had to do it all with numbers. And I saw how you could use all these numbers to make a program that would actually solve a problem. The math turned into the language because you can set up symbols that represent something. Just as in math, when you're teaching a, an equation, students see an X and I may see that that stands for the height of a building. 
And so you can make an interpretation between the numbers and the words. Most students who are struggling with math see letters and numbers. They don't see what they represent. And so a teacher can make math more interesting. I think you have to capture their attention with the problem first. And then you can go backwards and teach the skills. So what questions do you have on long signs? Any questions? Andrew? Yeah. Students that, that work on the mathematics gain many things beyond just doing the mathematics. They, they learn detail, paying attention to detail. They learn uh, looking at a problem and seeing it for its individual parts and breaking that down into its components and then sometimes putting that back together and tackle a smaller piece first. And once that's working and correct, then you can build upon that. If you have high anxiety and math is not your thing, and yet you know you're going into a career where you need to learn a certain amount of math, don't choose to put the math off to the last minute. Choose to start where your math ability is at. Don't try to jump ahead of where your math ability is at. Make sure you get a class that you can be successful in. Don't set the odds and make bad choices and pick a class that the odds weren't good in your, in your favor in the first place. It could be hard, but you can do it. So now our unknown is our opposite. We have our hypotenuse when we cross multiply. 8605 times the sine of 35, we end up with, give me an answer. I'm Patty Miller, and I teach math at Williamsport Area High School. I've been teaching the dual enrollment course at Penn College for five years now. So dual enrollment means that they get high school credit for their math classes, the high school mm -hmm. credit they need to graduate, and they earn college credit. It's a technical algebra with trig, so it's we don't get into the analytical side of trigonometry. It's mostly the applications. When will I ever use this? So it allows for more times for some hands-on activities um, and for them to do some more exploration. A couple weeks ago, the students used a, an, a tool called a theodolite to measure the angle of elevation to find different heights. And today we're going to introduce what if we don't have a right triangle? Um, how, would, how would you do that? And still using the same tools, um, but using the law of signs to do it. So we're going to send them out to find different heights um, of something that you wouldn't be able to necessarily measure, but could estimate. We have great technology here, and I used to take a protractor and tape a straw to the top, put a pinhole in it, and hang a, hang a washer with, with fishing line, and they would have to figure out the difference and, and determine the angle of elevation that way. I sometimes think that would be more fun, but now there's, a, there's an app for that. So they just hit a button and then it tells them the angle of elevation. But I think that's just also preparing them for you know, the real world. Some real world applications of this would be in construction, finding different side lengths, uh, make different cuts, uh, knowing and finding different angles. And then on a large scale, anything you're using for mapping, surveying, mm -hmm. if you uh, need to track anything, whether it's something in orbit, something in the sky, something far away. Could a superhero convince kids that learning math can be as fun and exciting as climbing rock walls? Climbing coach Mike Cherry thinks so. I decided there was a need for a math superhero. He created the Adventures of Plus Man comic books to help kids comprehend the language of mathematics, in which concepts matter more than numbers. When I was coming up with the idea of Plus Man, and I knew I wanted to make it humorous and I wanted to make it easily accessible to students so that they would read it and laugh. And the idea of, the, of, of incorporating puns into it and, and taking the language of math 
and creating a, a humorous, sort of campy math superhero comic book. And so the character, Adam, is sort of the stereotypical nerdy guy. And, and of course his name Adam together has the double meaning of add them together and he becomes plus man. Dr. Nine is the, the evil genius who's trying to take over the, the world, but he's taking over the world with math, not with some evil invention. The other character, there's, there's hexahedron who has a cube, his head is a cube. So, so hexahedron is the, so the Obi-Wan Kenobi of, of the characters where he can channel the math force. Um, A.D. DeGrangle, she works for the Galactic Math Police and, and she has her computer dog with three legs named Tripod. And um, she's actually the, the smartest character of, of the group. She's constantly sort of leading Adam on to, to help him solve things and, and helping him as plus man. Because even as a math superhero, he's a little bit not quite comfortable with the role. He, he suffers from math anxiety. So one of my ideas with Plus Man was I take a mathematical term and I make a pun between the mathematical term and the standard usage, usage term. And for the student to understand the joke, they actually have to understand both meanings. And the intent is that they would look through the book. They would see a term that they're not sure. Is it a math term or is it not a math term? If it, it might be, then they can look it up and they can explore what does it mean. The math itself feeds back on the language. So in order to understand one concept, it may take you three or four or five different places. So you're not learning a definition. You're learning a concept, and you're learning the construct of the math behind it. So you, are, you actually understand it from a broader sense. You can look at it from different perspectives, and that's what understanding is. I think my comic books make math accessible. You, you can't look at Plus Man and be terribly intimidated. He, he's not an intimidating character. So it's not a math book, it's a comic book. And they can begin to look at the math terms and, and see it in a different light where it's actually fun. It's not intimidating, it's not math. This is something other than what I've been learning. It's a different way of looking at it. I think a lot of career preparation follows along the same structure as the game. It's very similar to the gamification process. Uh, you have to start somewhere. And whenever I've mastered the skills of doing that, I'll be able to move up and so on. Don't assume necessarily that whatever you're interested in is necessarily going to be your career, but use that as an opportunity for curiosity and explore all the things that are related to it. You know, space exploration ultimately led me to computers. Uh, the fascination for computers ultimately led me back to mathematics. Sometimes there's the practical and the impractical, and you might love the impractical. Oftentimes, the person that strives to do the impractical and really devotes themselves to it finds that it becomes practical. And regardless of who you are, you will find there, there's some math that you will get and some math that you won't get. Being bad at one form of math doesn't negate that you're good at another form. And the more you do something, the more you become proficient in it and the more you begin to enjoy it, especially when you can see where it's useful and where it applies to the real world. Having an understanding of how that stuff works allows you to make a game of life, you know, and maximize your enjoyment of, of the systems that are around you, maximize your career opportunities. The career opportunities that are going to be coming down the pike are going to be information, computer, technology, electronics based. If you, if you can get an understanding of that, you've got a great future ahead of you. That's not going away. That, that is our future.